Hello, friends, relatives, um, and community. Thank you all for being here with us today. This event, as well as uh, the other uh, four Ripple Week sessions this week, are part of WIA's U.S. Grassroots Accelerator that for women environmental and climate leaders. And we're really excited to be able to offer these events open for the public for the first time. Um, and so thank you and welcome uh, to today's call. Um, I'm excited uh, in particular about today's call uh, because Ruth uh, was a US Accelerator participant and um, she just has so much wisdom to share with you all today. But before I dive in and introduce myself and our presenters, here are some notes on uh, how we're going to carry this space virtually. Uh, here on Zoom, we have things set so that everyone is muted upon entry. If you have any questions or comment, please be sure to use the chat function. Um, we will try to make some time at the end for questions, uh, but we might not have time for that. Uh, but we will be paying attention to your questions and there will be a follow-up email. Uh, so if we have uh, an opportunity to be able to do that uh, with your questions, we, we can follow up uh, later if we don't have a chance to dive into them in today's call. Um, and with that little bit of housekeeping done, my name is Daniela Perez and I am one, um, I am Director of North America and Pacific Programs at WIA. For those of you who are new to WIA, Women's Earth Alliance is a 16 year global initiative that trains, resources and catalyzes grassroots women's networks to protect our environment and build healthy and safe and just communities now and into the future. We uh, co-designs capacity building trainings where women leaders access technology, financing, mentorship, and a global alliance. Before we dive into today's call, I first want to recognize that while we are gathering virtually today, and while WIA has a global team located around the world, WIA's home base is located in what is currently known as Berkeley, California in the Bay Area, but what is also known as Wichin, the ancestral and unceded land of the Chochoyenyo speaking Ohlone people. And I want to thank our Ohlone relatives for allowing us to call this place home. We recognize that we are on stolen land and we as an organization and as community members have a responsibility to do all that we can to be good guests of these lands and its original stewards. And while land acknowledgements are an important first step, they must always be followed up with action. Here in Wichin, we take action by naming the ongoing and normalized colonization of indigenous lands, by speaking the original name of these lands, and by collaborating with local Ohlone leaders like Corinna Gould, the spokesperson of the Confederated Villages of the Lishane Ohlone, who is, not coincidentally, also a designer and facilitator in the U.S. Grassroots Accelerator Program. We also pay a Shumi land tax, which supports our colleagues at the Segorate Land Trust as they do the important work of rematriating the, the, their lands. We do this because we envision a future that is not only thriving and sustainable, but just. And now that I've shared that with you all, I would like to introduce today's speaker and topic. Like I shared, Ruth was a powerful participant in our 2020 cohort. During the heart of the pandemic, Ruth brought so much connective energy to our program. And we are so happy to continue collaborating with her as this work evolves. Ruth Shivaya Kisen Miller is a Danaean Athabascan and Ashkenazi Jewish woman raised in Degyaikak, Alaska. <laughs> Sorry if I'm butchering these names. Um, she is a member of the Kuryung tribe of Dillingham, of Dillingham through her fam 
Through her family is born, though her family is born from Kijik Village from the Lake Clark region. She graduated from Brown University, receiving a BA in Developmental Studies with a focus on Indigenous resistance. She has worked many years towards climate justice and regenerative economies, including international advocacy, national policy leadership, and local community roles. She served as a climate justice director for Native Movement for a number of years, is a founding member of the Fireweed Collective, a statewide alliance of politically minded young Alaskans. Now she turns her energies towards ancestral healing, time on the land, and cultural arts as she intertwines advocacy with self-expression, spiritual exploration, and liberatory joy. Ruth is a daughter, an auntie, a public speaker, a language learner, a traditional bead worker, and a singer. Ruth, thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, please feel free to take it away. And thank you to Dakia, who's in the background doing amazing tech support. I'm so humbled and honored to be here with you all. And man, it really, wow, it has been a long time I hadn't really realized. Uh, but that's right, our cohort of um, we had accelerators was, was during pandemic and yet we um, bonded so much and, and were able to share such precious time together. So it really is a, an honor to be here with all of you. Um, I was accompanied in that cohort by a very dear friend and collaborator of mine, Jessica Gerard, who um, who now lives down here between Denina and Atna lands in, in our territory, my territory, um, and who was also a WIA alumni of the same cohort. Uh, we are both trainers for Native Movement, uh, an indigenous nonprofit and land-based organization here in Alaska. Um, that works towards indigenous sovereignty and liberation through gender justice, climate justice, environmental justice, uh, arts and advocacy and healing work. Um, and so the training that um, we will be going through today um, is traditionally done by not one person. <laughs> Jessica and I are um, peas in a pod on this one. Um, and, uh, and has been created by um, a much larger team at Native Movement. So um, I want to acknowledge that genealogy of this training. Uh, this training is also like six hours long um, and we're going to be smushing it into about 35 or 40 minutes together. And so we'll be moving very, very quickly. Um, that means that we will not have an opportunity for a question or a question and answer. Um, but that I do not want folks to feel discouraged. Um, instead, what we will do is um, use the chat function a lot. So get ready to, to be prepared to respond to questions in the chat. And that's a really easy way to stay connected. And additionally, this full training can be accessed through the Native Movement website at nativemovement.org, um, where there is a sliding scale for both individuals and organizations to access not just this full training with myself, Jessica, and Ine all instructing, um, but also uh, self-paced modules and worksheets that we've developed to kind of help deeper reflection and integration. So with all of that said, I also want to acknowledge any elders that are here in the Zoom room with us. Um, I, I give you my grace and deep gratitude uh, for your wisdom and for joining us here today. Chinan Khali for our elders for being here. And similarly, if there are any indigenous relatives, I am real happy to see my kin. And I hope you all make yourselves known in the chat. Um, this, this, um, I, 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 the only other thing that I wanna preface this with is that this um, training is given through um, an indigenous lens. And so that is the, the way that our organization um, from the positionality that each of us hold have approached discussions on colonization. And with a multiracial staff, um, depending on the trainers that are available, um, we dive in in different ways and explore different um, forms of this, this topic um, and can hold different stories. But the stories that I'll share with you are ones that I've been given permission to carry um, or they are from me and I cannot share perspectives or stories past that. Right, 
Okay, well, I'll introduce myself the best way that I know how, which is in my language. Shivak isinch iji, dene ina kanaga shaskun kanash to chariang as nenish ite, as she does not Heather Kendall Miller, shukta, to Lloyd Miller, shukta, to U Pijne Venish Kaya Kilanda, to Udreya Kak Shuguya Studa, Echo Kathleen Chakaya Kilanda, to Uchariang as nenish ite, yet El Henun Bago Diachli et Sete. My English name is Ruth Miller. My Dena'ina name is Shivaik Isen, and I'm a Dena'ina woman calling in from my homelands here in Dekayakak of Anchorage, Alaska. Um, and let's get the ball rolling because we're going to be zooming. Akia, are you able to? Ah, awesome. Of course. So on your second slide, you'll see just a bit of our kind of agreement setting. And again, this is a very shortened um, training so we're not going through the whole six hour training in this one hour um i've picked select parts of it um which will still be a lot <laughs> and so that's what we'll be, we will be moving through and i'd love to see folks saying hi in the chat as well so the first agreements that we want to lay out is that we are not experts as i've said i've been given permission to carry stories uh, both from my comrades my community members my elders and my ancestors um, but we are not experts we we have made and will make mistakes uh, but we do commit to continuing to learn uh, in public public learning together and that's what all this is about we do hope to curate a safe space where all of us can be um, supported and humble in our learning but frankly we don't have time uh, to to waste to perpetuate white supremacy, anti-blackness, or colonial worldviews. So some might find this training a little bit harsh, and that's okay. It's okay to be uncomfortable. Um, we will move through it together. So on the next slide, we'll begin. No, the the blank slide, please. Thanks, Kia. All right, we're gonna start. First question for all of you. Dene inak kanach do? Dene inak kanach do? Aadri kla? Dene ina do desh shit? Jichla ko o kits ayani and sen? Nil do chedesh is shit? Dene inak kanach do? Dene inak shesh kinach? Uhuya shesh kinach? Shadene inak? How does that make you feel when I speak to you like that in a language you don't understand? I'll admit when we have six hours, I really start yelling. <laughs> Can we see in the chat some reactions to just being being spoken to in an uncomfortable way in a language that you don't understand? Confusion and on guard. Mm -hmm. Goosebumps. It's worse when I get real angry. Shame, mm -hmm. lost, unwelcome, anxiety, nervous, humiliated. Yes. So the reason why we start here is because we want to honor that many of us are holding grief. And so the next little bit that we'll talk about, I wanna give a bit of a trigger warning because we're going to start with uh, American Indian boarding schools. So the reason why we start talking about this is recognizing how far um, our people have come now. You know, I do see some comments about being happy to, to hear a language that that's an indigenous language. Um, and I'll just share that that's something I've had to struggle very much for and, and very much fight for because this country was founded on eradicating Native Americans like myself. I was never supposed to be here. So the motto of the Carlisle Indian School, which was one of the predominant boarding schools that often gets a lot of, of um, kind of at attention in the media was for this slogan um, established by US Captain Richard Pratt, kill the Indian and save the man. And we will go through um, a good amount of content about what that looked like and, and how that impacted indigenous communities across the US, but also what the point was, what the tool was and what this was meant to achieve. So not only was this the first Indian boarding school, but these boarding schools um, were assimilationist concentration camps. And I do not use that word lightly. Um, on the next slide, you'll see some 
uh, additional information about how many, I mean, at this point, thousands of children's graves have been found um, across the US and so-called Canada. Uh, Sheldon Jackson is an area in Alaska. As I said, I'm from Alaska. Our organization is based in Alaska. So much of our content uses Alaska as a bit of a case study. Um, but even here, um, you know, this far north, hundreds of children were discovered. Um, and, and so we are holding collective community grief. On the next slide, you'll see some quotes from some of our elders, uh, Fred John Jr. And so I'm going to give everyone just about one minute, maybe a little bit less to read this. And I'd like to see uh, some reactions in the chat, how it feels if this is new to you, how it feels if you're very familiar with this. Um, and I'll say that as we go, if you need to take screenshots of slides to read later or to research more later, I really encourage that, but please don't share them. So I'll take just a second to read from this dear elder Fred. I encourage folks to check in with your bodies, to take deep breaths, to see how your bodies are responding to this information. Uh, Fred is a very dear elder to us from Mentasta Village. Um, he's a very gentle man and has um, turned his energies towards supporting young people. Um, and it's been very beautiful to support our elders in overcoming uh, their deep childhood trauma. And so as we move through some reactions in the chat, don't be shy. Um, I can outweigh all of you. How does this make you feel to read? It's hard, isn't it? It's hard for me every time I do this training. Mm -hmm. We've got one emoji, deep sorrow and anger, brutal aghast. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Some of us are seeing ourselves in these words, our family members, our children. It's beyond words, yes. So let's move to the next slide. Thank you for that. Some of us might be familiar with this from our old colonial history textbooks. I went to public school, definitely saw a lot of this. Um, if for those who want to drop in the chat what this painting is of, um, You'll, you'll see below manifest destiny, a phrase that many of us have heard from as well. Um, and the title of this painting is called American Progress. Uh, can folks note some observations? What do you see in this painting of American Progress? As we go, just for a lack of time, I'm gonna point out some things I always see. Um, moving from light into darkness, of course you see chasing the Indians off, um, as well as chasing the buffalo there in the corner. Um, you see uh, increasing fences, you see these um, new railways and horse-drawn carriages being pulled in, um, but mostly you see even down here, you know, bears being chased off into the dark. And what about this figure, the white angel? Mm-hmm. Yeah, this is this is the image of you know lady. It, it, this is this the lady of the empire, um, white skin of course, and the star of the empire stringing up a line. Um, does anyone have an idea what the what the book is in her hand? The Bible, the Bible. Actually, uh, the book of education, a school book, which says a lot, right? So this was very much the ethos that was in play um, of this, you know, angelic, pure culture coming in um, to dominate, to take the lands, obviously, and to push all else off of them. And this is the core of um, the colonial machine. So on the next page, we'll be looking at some definitions 
uh, which we're just going to breeze through because we're going to be working with them a bit more. Colonialism, which is the policy or practice of acquiring political control over another country or land, occupying it with settlers. And I want to point out not immigrants, not refugees, settlers, and exploiting it economically. Colonization, which is an ongoing process, not an event, not something that has ended, but something that is continuously ongoing. The process of devaluing and dehumanizing Native people through both formal and informal methods in order to justify exploiting them in their homelands. So at the same time that, so let's stick there for just one moment, at the same time that Indigenous people were being relegated into a system that was ever decreasing, some might be familiar with the blood quantum system, which was never an Indigenous approach to family and kinship and our clan structures, um, but there was this idea that with each generation being native could be bred out of you, much like with horses or dogs, while at the same time, enslaved Black folks were trapped in perpetual slavery. And so it was very apparent that there were these conflicting logics that only served to secure land by making natives be erased, while also securing labor by making it impossible to ever escape servitude or slavery, excuse me. And so it's quite plain to observe the ways that the U.S. was set up from its very foundations to exploit anyone who wasn't white. So in the next definition, we'll explore settler colonialism. And we'll do so with a quote from Tuck and Yang uh, from their 2013 publication. Settlers are not immigrants. Immigrants are beholden to the indigenous laws and ways of knowing epistemologies of the lands they migrate to. Settlers instead become the law, supplanting indigenous laws and epistemologies. And so reeling it back again to the establishment of this country, uh, we can look at the doctrine of discovery, which was um, a what was called the, the papal bull, a, a law of the Pope, a law of the Vatican, which supported European nations to go out and conquer other places, be it Africa or um, the North American continent, for their use and profit, to reduce the people they found there into perpetual slavery, and to specifically target non-Christian subjects, Saracens and pagans, uh, to convert them um, to their use and profit. And so it was very, and, and this was the, um, the excuse, the justification um, that many European nations used. And so on the next slide, you'll see just a quick snapshot. We're not gonna watch this video um, because we won't have the time, but this is a TED talk um, by Michael Charles, a really incredible Diné man and scholar who actually once ran for president. Um, and I'm going to drop the YouTube video of this TED talk here in the chat. And what I really recommend is starting at minute 315 <coughs> and watching the whole thing. But at minute 315, he gets into a very compelling discussion about, of course, the Declaration of Independence in which natives are referred to as merciless Indian savages and the American constitution, which does not refer to any female pronouns. Um, and only describes the ways that non-white people would be subjugated, you know, the American constitution. He then gets into um, a very interesting, um, I mean, and heartbreaking and gut-wrenching story of, of the legal battles um, that indigenous nations have undergone in attempting to reclaim sovereignty. Um, and time and time again, the decisions that have come down uh, from the courts have been in favor of these founding documents, which were fundamentally white supremacist documents. Um, and I'll give away the big reveal now, you know, in one of the most recent um, court decisions settling the Johnson versus McIntosh uh, case, I believe, um, which was issued in 2015, the Supreme Court of the United States, you know, this, this generation um, reinscribed 
the white supremacist nature of these documents incited strongly against native interests, you know, as recently as 2015. And who was the justice that wrote the opinion? None other than Ruth Bader Ginsburg. So we have to interrogate some of our cultural heroes, um, particularly, you know, those that, you know, rise to um, kind of cultural phenomena for being these great advocates for justice when they also fail to advocate for racial justice. And so this TED talk is a great introduction to federal Indian policy, which is which is on the next slide, and which is not something that we're going to have time to get into today. This is usually my area of expertise in this training, so I am a little bit upset, <laughs> but we don't have six hours, understandably. And so I just wanted to share some of the underlying assumptions of federal Indian policy, which is the correct term to use when talking about these series of uh, litigations and, and laws that were passed um, to purposefully subjugate Indians through a variety of different techniques. And we'll actually look at how those techniques change. But the underlying goals, you know, not even assumptions, really goals of this of federal Indian policy and the way that the United States government has decided to, tr to deal with Native nations has been based on the thoughts that Indians would assimilate, Indians would eventually disappear or die off, or that Indians would be purposefully exterminated. And so as we call back the ethos of, you know, kill the Indian, save the man, it was all about extracting Christian um, laborers <laughs> from Indians. And if they could not be, if they could not be converted, if they could not uh, be made to give up their land, then they should be executed. So on the next slide, um, just very, very briefly, there are a number of different eras of federal Indian policy um, that have been kind of categorized as the politics of the United States change. We consider ourselves to now be in the self-determination era, um, but let me tell you, it is quite an uphill battle, and we'll get into some very present uh, contemporary battles shortly. Uh, but of course, the treaty era was the time of signing treaties. This was before Alaska was, was being dealt with, so we do not have any treaty tribes up in Alaska. Um, but the upon encountering Native nations, um, they were dealt with as foreign nations would have been through treaties. However, many of these were, of course, very coercive. Uh, many of them were, you know, signed with with by folks who were not in positions of power within tribal governance structures. Maybe many of them were signed, you know, at gunpoint or, you know, by folks who obviously did not read English writing. Um, that, however, paled to the removal area era, uh, which relocated entire nations to reservations. You know, very tiny swatches of land, often very far away. Um, that were considered, you know, less useful, um, oftentimes on the west of the Mississippi, uh, that had not yet been conquered by settlement. Uh, we moved to the allotment and assimilation era when people decided that they actually wanted that reservation land too and needed a new formula. So they um, forced Indian tribes and individuals to become agriculturalists, leaving behind their um, nomadic preferences and lifestyles that had sustained us for millennia, uh, but instead forcing people with no money into a cash economy and into perpetual debt. So there was actually a huge loss of Indian land through tax foreclosure. Um, and at some point your land would have no protection for being taken. That led to the termina termination era where Congress passed a resolution that began a new federal era uh, where Congress had the power to just terminate a tribe. So some tribes, particularly in California, um, where I know many folks are calling in from, were terminated, were just uh, disintegrated um, in the eyes of the US government, not in the eyes of tribal people. Um, and of course, once these tribes were, you know, again, in the eyes of the US, disbanded, their land could be sold. Um, that led us to the assimilation era. Um, which is kind of in between the reorganization and termination era all through that, all through those decades, um, which of course was the era of boarding schools when mass assimilation um, was being pursued in an attempt to, to stamp out Indian uh, resistance. And of course, as you read in the stories by Fred John Jr., that often meant taking children away from their homes uh, and forcing them into schools where they would be entirely culturally isolated, um, physically and sexually assaulted, 
um, and traumatized to the point where they um, would would lose their cultures at best and be killed at worst. Um, and it was only in the 1960s that we began even considering entry into the self-determination era, um, actually under Kennedy, Johnson, and, and Nixon um, that began addressing tribal issues. So on the next slide, we're not gonna chat about it. Again, I'm a little sad about, but I do recommend folks that are interested in learning more about federal Indian policy. Um, could you go back to that one here? Thank you, to take a screenshot of it. Um, so these are some of the real, um, the, the real kind of big focal points of federal Indian law. And you can observe through a list like this. And of course, there were many other, many other efforts to disenfranchise Native peoples, but you can see um, these just these sweeping acts that impacted so much. And of course, um, these photos show um, both the forced marches um, that were, um, that, that our peoples were forced into, that many reservation tribes were forced into, wherein many folks died of starvation or hunger or the elements. Um, but of course, you also see this photo from Alaska of uh, boarding schools. And I've always been very curious about this photo um, because I'm just so certain that their parkies would have been taken too. And so I wonder why they're still allowed to wear their beautiful fur parkies, these two boys. So we are going to take a big, deep breath all together. And again, recognize that we're zooming through a lot of information and I know I'm not giving um, enough context, but I hope it's just making you more excited to watch the full training. Because the next thing that we're gonna talk about is conservation and the way that land management and conservation uh, intertwined with these, um, with these, these due processes of dehumanization. So while the US government, oh, and I really encourage folks to be writing in the chat. It helps me to see what everyone's thinking and where you're at, even if you're just dropping the emotion that you're feeling right now. While the US government was committing mass genocide, relocating indigenous peoples from their traditional and sacred lands, a conservation movement was being born. At the same time where these mass atrocities against humans were being committed, there was this sense that land was not only important, but also beautiful and had some sort of significance beyond just the, the use of resources, but that somehow did not resonate with indigenous land that had deep spiritual and emotional and ancestral ties to those same lands based on the same principles of sacredness and beauty. So we pull out these men um, because it really informs what we tell ourselves about heroic conservationists. Some of you might recognize um, them and we'll be getting into a little bit more as well. But uh, some of the men pictured are Gifford Pinchot, John Muir, President Theodore Roosevelt. Um, and they're especially relevant because of their roles in creating the Sierra Club and uh, the US Forest Service, as well as really the, the dawn of the conservation movement. The modern environmental movement has placed great emphasis on the preservation of nature, on, on keeping an untouched wilderness safe from destructive tendencies of humans. Um, and, and Cronin, this is a quote that we often use um, by a scholar, Cronin, um, and they keep a great emphasis on venerating certain places as examples of the sublime where one could glimpse the face of God. And so it's often categorized by the same author that there are three W's of conservation. Does anyone have an idea what they are? The three W's? You can guess one if you want. Of early conservation. The three W's of the early conservation movement and arguably the modern conservation movement. See, white, wealthy, wilderness. Mm-hmm. Any other guesses? Wonder. Mm -hmm. Cronin's three W's were white Western wilderness. So well done. 
And still today, you know, the conservation movement fluctuates between conservation, you know, keeping land into trust with variable access to it, of course, all highly regulated versus preservation, which um, preservationists and preservation movements feel that any human activity is destruction of the nature, regardless of the fact that indigenous people have never been separate from nature. Um, so we'll, we'll discuss Gifford Pinchot first who was a fierce advocate for conservation. How many folks have heard of Gifford Pinchot? Raise your hand or drop in the chat. Most folks that have worked for a long time in conservation and environmental movements have. Yep, 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 yep. Yeah, so his theory was grounded in uh, conservation of not only land, but also the racial stock of America. And so we pulled this quote from National Vitality, It's Waste and Conservation, which was a presentation that he made to Congress. Um, and he was quoted stating, the problem of the conservation of our natural resources is not a series of independent problems, but a coherent, all-embracing whole, the conservation of the racial stock itself. Gifford Pinchot understood that seizing land uh, by white men would have to be done without native people and that native claims to land would always supersede um, the US imperial mission. And so um, over the following decades, multiple states passed laws influenced by eugenics uh, that outlawed various types of marriages and authorized forced sterilization amongst mentally disabled, the poor, people of color. All of this was happening at the same time. The next conservation hero that we like to discuss is John Muir, founder of the Sierra Club, wrote our national parks. Who's heard of John Muir? So yeah, pulling these quotes out again, um, you'll see these two here on the screen. Uh, they seem to have no, no right place in the landscape and I was glad to see them fading out of sight down the pass. As to Indians, most of them are dead or civilized into useless in innocence. Jessica often reads these quotes and, and when she discusses this third, poor fellows, they have been poisoned, trapped and shot at until they have lost confidence in brother man. She had uh, pulled this quote from some of his writings and was like, okay, well, wow, we're finally getting to the, you know, kind of some, some sense of <laughs> sympathy, uh, some, some shared intelligibility. No, no, he was talking about bears. Bears have lost confidence in brother man. <laughs> um, so yeah, so there was a lot of embedded racism um, in in his writings, reporting on um, on you know detrimental qualities of other races, which I just don't want to repeat. Um, and he really enforced um, a biological inferiority of non-white folks. Um, and yet his writings were and remain instrumental in conservation work. And many young conservationists, uh, folks that are interested in joining the environmental movement often read John Muir first or recommended John Muir. Um, and, it's, and it's interesting because we have to hold at the same time, um, yes, his conservation ethos, um, while also acknowledging um, that he was you know, committing these these ideological violences against non-white people we can hold those at the same time and we can acknowledge that he was a product of his times that he could not separate himself from it but it is imperative that we learn to push back against the type whenever possible to not repeat the same practices especially now under the urgency of the climate crisis we are demanding from the conservation movement a reckoning with their racial history and their lack of racial justice in their founding. And largely we have been um, seeing a lot of progress on this front. Um, and a lot of that can be you know, seen even through the lens of sacred sites uh, being returned. Um, but we'll discuss some of those sacred sites now, which unfortunately are not being returned. <laughs> Uh, on the next slide, uh, we kind of want to drop into a bit of a case study before we talk about Teddy Roosevelt as well. Um, some folks in the chat might recognize these if you know what they are, go for it. Um, but these sacred sites um, are important kind of windows into, um, you know, the, 
it's our lands that empower us to tell stories. And they're important windows into this evolution of conversation around lands. And so the first is six grandfathers, otherwise known as Mount Rushmore. On the next slide, please. Um, according to the Fort Laramie Treaty of 1868, this was meant to this land was meant to belong to American Indians in perpetuity. Uh, but after an expedition led by General Custer discovered gold there in 1874. Of course, the treaty was scrapped and the Lakota were forced to, reserve, uh, to relocate to reservations. And so we think about this, this beautiful sacred site of the Lakota that was then carved away to leave the faces of presidents for presidents of the US. Well, which presidents were those? Lincoln, Washington, Jefferson, and Roosevelt. You can keep pressing enter Kia two more times. Lincoln was responsible for hanging the Dakota 38, the largest mass hanging in U.S. history. Washington declared an all-out extermination against the Iroquois in 1779. Thomas Jefferson supported assimilation and, failing that, extermination. He said all natives should be driven beyond the Miss Mississippi or take up the hatchet and never lay it down until they are all exterminated. And the founder of the U.S. Forest Service, Theodore Roosevelt, and a huge advocate uh, for establishing national parks and wildlife refuges. He, uh, soon after being elected governor of New York, announced the continent had to be one. We need not waste time in dealing with any sentimentalist who believes that on account of any abstract principle, it would have been right to leave this continent to the domain, the hunting ground of squalid savages. It had to be taken by the white race. So Bears Lodge as well uh, is now called Devil's Tower. It's uh, traditionally a sacred uh, site that is now facing a whole suit of litigations um, because, uh, because it is a conservation base and many uh, folks that recreate there are suing to use the rock for rock climbing specifically during traditional ceremony times. Um, there are some some important um, documentaries that have been made about this and the way that like outdoor recreation can be really complicit uh, in, in racism. And we just like to uplift this quote by Evelyn Nakano Glenn here. When analyzing conservation in the framework of settler colonialism, it is not just about sustaining a place, but reaffirming colonization, which separates, eliminates through replacement and continues to dominate. And so the last example that we want to bring up is the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, which is here in my home on Inupiaq and Gwich'in lands. It is the sacred place where life begins. Um, and I got to spend a good amount of time there in just this summer. Um, as it says in its title, it's a national wildlife refuge and yet is constantly under attack. Um, it has been uh, elevated to the news quite a lot recently. Um, as a center of many, many different forms of litigation um, and political fights uh, as we struggle to keep it from being opened up for oil drilling and fracking. Um, and the tribes of the area, um, especially on the coastal plain are extremely activated um, in protecting their lands and the animals that roam there. Um, they don't wanna be restricted in using the land that they have been used for thousands of years. Um, but yet we see that um, it is still so deeply um, persecuted that it takes movements to, to a huge scale. I mean, national allyship um, to defend the refuge. And even as we you know, see it debated in Congress and in lawsuits, if you go to the next slide, Kia, please, uh, we threw a word map up of, um, of you know, proposals of, this this was um, an act that was proposed for its protection. Even in this word map of you know what words were most used, does anyone see an upiak in this word map? You know we see which in there, very very small in the top, but mostly what we see are wilderness and wildlife. While we have to acknowledge that there's nothing natural about these concepts which separate the natural world from the sustainable and reciprocal relationship that indigenous peoples have always had with this world. And so 
I'm going to take a deep breath. I encourage other folks to, and in our very last little bit of time, we're going to get into culture, um, particularly white supremacy culture and decolonization. If folks want to share thoughts in the chat of how they're feeling so far, um, I'm always, I always feel quite drained doing this, uh, doing this training and, you know, especially not without, without the support of the folks that are usually with me, heavy and sad. Yeah, but let's try to transform that, right? Let's try to transform that. So what are the ways that we can engage, uh, interrupt, investigate, learn, and activate ourselves and folks um, in our movements to no longer be complicit in these dynamics? Well, culture, let's start with culture. It's a way of life of a group of people right? The behaviors, beliefs, values, and symbols that they accept. So there's some form of agency here in what you accept uh, to adopt into your culture. Generally, it's without thinking about them, but they're passed along by communication and imitation from one generation to the next. On the next slide, we'll look at white supremacy culture, which is the idea, the ideology that white people and the ideas, thoughts, beliefs, and actions, and creations, and writings, and you know, teachings of white people are superior to people of color, and their ideas, thoughts, beliefs, and actions, and much more. And we see that come up in a huge myriad of ways. Something that I was taught early on is that, you know, white supremacy culture is like the water we're all swimming in. It's all around us. And because we have you know, if those in the U.S. live, work, play in a white supremacist country, it is also complicit in many of our laws, you know, in the ways that municipalities are run and the way that governments are run. So we need to be able to learn how to identify it both in ourselves, in others, in our community, in our government, so that we can intervene and transform it into something more liberatory and just, right? And so the next two slides, um, I really encourage folks to sit with and to take screenshots if you can. These on the right side, excuse me, on the left side are characteristics of white supremacy culture, the ways that white supremacy culture might come up in our day-to-day -day lives, might come up in ourselves, and then what transforming that into a system that doesn't rely on capitalism, that doesn't rely on exploitation, that doesn't rely on hierarchies or power domination. What a community uh, that is founded in just transition and reciprocity could look like. Transforming perfectionism to learning organization. I'd, I would say stick on that slide for just one more second, Kia, please. Thank you. Transforming defensiveness to openness. Um, only one right way to honoring different ways of doing. Who resonates with any of these? I'll start, I am totally a perfectionist, super perfectionist. Another one that gave me a lot of pauses is worship of the written word. You know, for those of us that have gone through, you know, a Western schooling system, that's what we're trained in. You know, if it hasn't been published, it does, it's not true. Can folks drop in the chat which of these they're resonating with and which they wanna work on? Okay, what about this next slide? Here's some more. Moving from power hoarding to power sharing, individualism to collectivism. Yeah, urgency, urgency is a big one. Mm -hmm. Instead of I'm the only one that can do this delegating, working as community. And I think even about, you know, I've worked in, movement organizing for 10 years and I am so hard on myself. I, I am now in deep recovery and have stepped away from my work because of the ways that I, as an indigenous woman, was complicit in harming myself uh, it, through the amount of stress that I imposed on myself, right? And the stressful environments, particularly around urgency um, that we, you know, in some ways feel forced to bow to in, in climate organizing. Um, we are so indoctrinated into seeing success as you know extractive. We have to work as hard as we can for as long as we can. And the harder you work, the better you are. 
You know, it's this whole ethos of pulling yourself up by your bootstraps um, that only <laughs> serves to uh, support capitalism, to make sure that we labor harder, though we might not be getting very much out of it, and to keep us um, ill, to keep us sick. Um, and so when I first started turning towards my own wellness, I realized that I needed to change pace. I needed to um, decolonize my own mind. And instead of think about everything that I was doing, you know, being very caught up in individualism and I'm the only one, I called back my indigenous values and principles to remind myself that actually our movements don't need martyrs. We need sustainability. We need movements that wherein we can rest, we can raise babies, we can garden, we can take care of our bodies. Um, our organization, Native Movement, began shifting to a pace of creation. Uh, we moved to a four-day work week, and at first it was like, okay, I guess we're just, you know, doing the same amount of work in less time, but actually it helped us um, determine what work was most crucial, where we were making the most impact, and also think about how to move uh, with a pace that resonated with our seasons, knowing that we all needed to be out on the land in summertime, and we all needed to be with our family and loved ones and community in wintertime, when up here it's very cold and dark. And so it allowed us to shift to a more humane way of organizing after we um, were bold enough to recognize the ways that we had been complicit in our own exploitation, even as an Indigenous nonprofit fighting for environmental justice, climate justice, gender justice. And so we'll see on the next slide, um, just one way of defining uh, various levels of oppression so that we can learn to understand them more. Uh, internalized oppression, which again is what we impose on ourselves, uh, the lies and misconceptions we believe about our own group, but I'll also say, you know, when we don't trust ourselves, uh, when we don't feel um, well-resourced, when we don't take care of ourselves, when we don't think we're worthy of care, interpersonal oppression or lateral violence between people of the same oppressed group, um, which is oftentimes a result of trauma and a result of untended wounds that are sitting on our hearts, right? Uh, when we are unkind uh, to those because we see a mirror uh, of ourselves in them. And of course, institutional oppression uh, by governments, schools, prisons, corporations. Oh my gosh, so much to talk about there. But we want to, you know, not just work on identifying these things, but give you some tools for what it might look like to start to intervene in your own organizations or even at, you know, the Thanksgiving table. Um, and so when we talk about decolonization on the next slide, we're not talking about a metaphor. Um, we're talking about the conscious, intelligent, calculated, and active unlearning and resistance to the forces of colonization that perpetuate the subjugation and exploitation of our minds, bodies, and lands. So it's conscious, unlearning, and resistance. It takes active resistance, and it is engaged for the ultimate purpose of overturning the colonial structure, structure and realizing collective liberation. And I'll also just say, like, saving the world. Colonization has nearly killed our planet, in addition to the millions and millions of, I mean, billions of lives um, that have been sacrificed for it. We are, you know, my background is in climate advocacy. We are at a terrifying uh, decision point. Um, we may very well be too late, but if in the next eight years we do not move uh, strategically and systemically towards just transition, dismantling systems of oppression and systems of exploitation that create such consumerist cultures and create such globalized demands, then we will have no home. Then the, the mass hurricanes and storms that we've been observing across the world will only get worse. Decolonization is the only way forward. Decolonization and just transition towards a collective liberation towards a brighter uh, world of reciprocity uh, that returns to our indigenous values. So on the next slide, you'll see a quote from um, a scholar named Yellow Bird uh, from their 2008 publication. Decolonization is the restoration of cultural practices, thinking, beliefs, and values that were taken away or abandoned, but are relevant and or necessary for survival and well-being. So it's not just 
leaving colonization, but it is rebuilding and restoring. It's the birth and use of new ideas, thinking technologies and lifestyles that contribute to the advancement and empowerment of indigenous people. So in the last little bit that we have here, we wanted to go through some tools that uh, we can offer. And again, take screenshots as you need or take the whole training, really recommend. But one tool our organization uses and many of our partners use are the Jemez Principles of Democratic Organizing, um, which recognizes that building and practicing a decolonizing framework uh -oh. <laughs> um, must recognize a history of colonization and its current manifestation. And so this helps us see how our organizations can function on an internal level and um, so that we can be better allies to one another so that we can um, create better interconnectivity throughout our many justice movements, um, particularly as we come together across many sectors and hold ourselves to a high standard um, so that we can participate in transformation. So these six principles are here in the corner, be inclusive, emphasis on bottom-up organizing, let people speak for themselves. And we'll touch on that in a moment. Work together in solidarity and mutuality, build just relationships among ourselves and commit to self-transformation. The next slide is a guide on decolonizing wealth. Uh, which I really, we're not going to have time to get into, but I really do hope folks take a um, picture of. This is uh, created by Edgar Villanueva uh, and can be found on decolonizingwealth.com, which is just an incredible resource anyway. Um, but the main point that I find in this um, approach is investment, is that Indigenous communities need investment. Uh, we need resources and an economy that is not ours and was not made for us to thrive so that we can create and build a sustainable local economy so that we can divest from consumerism and capitalism in the global market and invest ourselves in our spiritual practices, our cultural practices, and our land and water tending practices, whether it's cultural fire burning or kelp harvesting, that will be the solution to the climate crisis. But decolonizing wealth is a very important entry point uh, for non-Indigenous folks and organizations to support Indigenous initiatives. Um, the next slide is about land acknowledgements. We heard a beautiful land acknowledgement today, uh, and so we'll be able to move right through this. Um, this is an example of a land acknowledgement, which can also be found um, on our website. And on the next slide, I just want to pick up on the very last paragraph. We acknowledge this as a point of reflection for us all as we continue our work towards dismantling colonial practices. Something I often remind folks uh, when I'm asked to give an acknowledgement here on my homelands is that uh, land acknowledgement isn't anything. It is empty if it's not accompanied by action. It is a call to action and it's a responsibility. Um, as much as the Segorate land tax, the Shumi land tax is a request for you know direct uh, reparations for occupying indigenous territories, land acknowledgements are similarly a call to give back, a call for reciprocity, whether that's financially, spiritually, um, or in accordance with the, the cultural practices of the tribe whose lands you live on in the US or Canada. Uh, the next tool um, is a very important one, which again, we won't have so much time to get into, but it's a tool of truth and reconciliation, uh, which some of our uh, relatives in Canada might be more familiar with, um, and similarly have been held across the, the world, um, marginally in, in New Zealand and in South Africa as well. Um, but something that I like to think of uh, here when we talk about truth and reconciliation, um, is also what, what does that look like with the land? What does truth and reconciliation look like with the land? How do we pay reparations to the land itself, to the waters themselves for the ways that they've been hurt? On the next slide is free prior and informed consent, which is a right under the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. I'm sorry, maybe, one, oh, there we go, this slide. And this, um, <laughs> this image is very dear to me um, because I, I designed it with a very uh, wonderful artist, a local artist here. 
and I'm Jesse Thornton, who's the Arts and Action Coordinator for Native Movement, that describes free prior and informed consent for all uh, development projects on Indigenous lands or impacting Indigenous lands and people, um, which again, uh, the US, sorry, the UN has, has declared a fundamental right of all Indigenous nations and communities. However, um, UNDRIP, the, that declaration, uh, though written decades ago, has not been ratified by the US, um, Canada, Australia, and I believe maybe New Zealand just did recently, but, you know, places with a lot of Indigenous peoples. Um, and of course, for it makes sense because that would require them to defer to Indigenous sovereignty in determining all proposed, you know, oil, gas, and mining projects, which they do not do so far. And so as we're moving towards the end here, we just have a couple more tools. Thanks for staying on. And if folks have to hop off, I understand. Um, but the next tool is investigating narrative sovereignty and thinking about the ways that Indigenous peoples are represented. Um, you know, thinking about the ways that you see Indigenous peoples. Now we come into, you know, Know, a really beautiful narrative ecosystem that has you know, reservation dogs and Molly of Denali and all these incredible indigenous shows, but those come from labor and decades of advocacy uh, from incredible indigenous artists and filmmakers. Um, and so this is a really incredible resource for those who are in media uh, and filmmaking uh, by imaginative on-screen protocols and pathways. Um, which is a media production guide uh, to working with indigenous communities um, and respectfully uh, engaging with concepts, uh, stories, and, and um, particularly, you know, cultural tales. And then lastly, um, this next page is uh, an exercise we did called the spectrum of decolonization. Uh, we're not going to be going through this activity but um, you know, this is something to consider where you might think these different tools land, you know, on a scale of effective to non-effective, performative decolonization or actually decolonizing practices. You know, where does co-management of federal and state lands go? Where does, you know, where do public apologies go? Uh, or land back campaigns. You know, this is something that each of us have to consider and work on within our organizations to understand where on the spectrum we fall and where we want to push ourselves to. Um, and where our theory of change sees all of these techniques. And then super lastly, um, we want to talk about this um, resource that we have on our Native Movement website, uh, which is uh, kind of a bit of a checkbox for organizations to go through decolonizing in practice. Um, we, by no surprise, <laughs> um, are out of time to go through some of the other pieces that I was excited to share um, around, you know, specifically talking to white folks work and mixed race folks work, which is a positionality that I speak from. But I want to skip um, as we close to um, a few slides ahead. Yeah, I'll tell you when and share a quote by Rachel Cargill. One more. And one more. Oh, one before that. <laughs> oh, <laughs> two before that. <laughs> yes. So this has been a trip. This is a very intense training. Um, and I'm very pleased uh, to have the opportunity to share with all of you. But, you know, I know how exhausting it is to provide this training. I know how exhausting it is to receive this training. So I really hope that folks give themselves support and, um, the one thing that we really want to emphasize too is that if if you're a white person that's having some feelings come up that's having some questions or is feeling you know surprised um, we request that you do not go to your closest indigenous friend and place this on their shoulders you know they certainly have already heard this um, or will find their own pathway um, to learning and they certainly um you know, feel this burden in a unique and ancestral way. Um, so we really encourage folks to share with the people around them that are already in their circles, um, to discuss in your communities and your organizations, um, you know, what this training has brought to you, what more questions you have. I'm sure everyone has a lot more questions because it's been a quick time together. And lastly, we'll end with this quote from Rachel Cargo. You will feel like your foundation is crumbling. You will want to grasp onto what you've always known. You will crave to run back to the comfort of your privilege. You will feel hurt. You will feel confused. 
You will feel attacked. And in the midst of it all, you'll survive. Keep going. There is work to do. So on our last, on our next slide are just some resources from Native Movement, um, which you can find on our website. And uh, then on our next slide are just some questions for those that are still with us. If you want to um, you know, journal, if you want to take some time to sit with these questions, what's something that's hurting, what's something that's healing, what we'll be sharing resources as uh, Danielle and Kia have already been doing in the chat. Um, and then on our last slide is the uh, um, website where you can take the full training. Who? Only seven minutes over. <laughs> Chinan Khalid, thank you all so much for taking this time with me. It's always a pleasure. Um, I always wish we had more time and I really, truly encourage everyone to, to take this full training and to encourage your organizations too. Um, I will not be available for the next month. Um, I will not be available to receive emails, but our organization is always a wonderful resource. And I uh, wish that we could have had a lot more mutuality and reciprocity. I wish we were all in person sitting in a big circle. Um, and I'm just, I'm just so humbled and proud to be here with all of you. Thank you for the time that you've given me and sorry for talking straight for an hour. <laughs> Thank you so much, Ruth, for such a powerful presentation. I enjoyed it deeply. Uh, and, you know, I appreciated the invitations to breathe in between and to really you know, take time to digest this information, which is what I suggest for everybody on today's call is to really take the time to digest this information and see how it can change your perspectives and the way that you work in the world and the way that you relate with each other. Um, it was a privilege to host you today uh, on behalf of WIA. We thank you so much and we wish you the best in this start of a new journey for you, uh, celebrating your healing, celebrating the space that you're taking for yourself. Uh, we are going to be clapping our way uh, for you to, uh, you know, get exactly what you're looking for in this spiritual journey. Um, so thank you for that. Um, and I just wanted to say everybody who's joined today, thank you. Today is our last Ripple Week call. Uh, so we've definitely gone out with a bang with this talk and we appreciate your presence and your attendance in all the other talks. We will be following up with an email with resources, information, and recordings from the calls. So please reach out if you have any questions. Uh, the the my information is at WIA's websites. It's also my email. It's Daniela at women's earth, earth alliance.org if you want to reach out for anything. Uh, but we recognize that we are at time. So uh let's just uh call it an end to today's call. Uh it seems a little bit unceremonious, but we know that you know. Each of us will take time to celebrate in our in our ways, uh, in our homes and communities. So thank you so much for being here, everybody.